Hi there everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology. Today we're looking at Unit 2, Multicellular Organisms, and we're going on to Key Area 5, which is Transport Systems in Plants. So, to start off with, we're going to be looking at plants and just basically how they transport things through their system. So first of all, we should hopefully know that plants need water. Okay, water is one of the crucial things that plants need. And there are three uses for water that plants have, and we need to know these. So first of all, plants need water to maintain turgor. Now, turgor would hopefully sound like a word you've heard before, which is turgid. If you remember that when a plant cell swells up, we don't call it swollen up or swelling up, we call it turgid, so it's swollen. So therefore, turgor in plants are when all the plant cells are, uh, to an extent, turgid, which means it keeps the plant upright. If you think of a plant didn't have any water, the first thing that happens to it is that it wilts. That's because these cells are not turgid anymore, therefore it cannot keep its structure properly. So the first thing that's needed is to maintain turgor. Second of all, it is needed for photosynthesis. So we've looked at the photosynthesis key area before, but you should hopefully remember that water is a really important part of stage one during photolysis, where the water gets split into hydrogen and oxygen, and that's required for stage two, and the oxygen goes away. And the last one, plants are a bit like us. They need water in order to keep cool. So if you think of things like cacti or other succulents, if they're in hot environments, they need all this water in order to keep cool. How cool, you may ask? That cool, I apologize. So the next part we need to look at is how this water actually gets into the plant. So water enters these roots that you've obviously uh, came across before uh, by osmosis. But what we want to look at here on this picture on the right, this root that's coming out of a uh, newly growing seed has all these little hairy bits across the roots and these are called root hairs. The purpose of root hairs is to increase surface area. If you increase surface area, you take in more water. So the more root hairs this root has, then it takes in more water through osmosis. And hopefully you remember that osmosis is the movement of molecules from an area of high water concentration to an area of low con water concentration, which would be the root cells itself. And the water is now inside the plant system. So again, just make sure you know this bit here. That the purpose of the root hairs is to increase surface area. Roots are great. They are needed to take up water. But the more root hairs you have, the more water molecules and other minerals you'll be able to take up. So next, now that the water is inside this plant system, we want to see how it can get to other parts of the leaf, or the plant rather. So plants use different sort of vessels called xylem to transport water up through the plant. So you'll see it on the picture here, xylem is it's almost like a straw. They are hollow, they are dead tubes, they are not living, and they are supported by little rings of lignin that give that structure for them, keeps them standing up. So the important things to note here, because we're going to compare this with another type of vessel in a minute, is that xylem transports water, the water only goes up the xylem, and xylem is dead, and it also has these lignin structures to go and support it. The other plant vessel that we want to look at though is called phloem and this is what you'd normally be asked to compare or describe the differences of. So phloem is a bit different, it's used to transport sugar. Also it transports sugar up and down the plant. So when you have all these sugars, all this glucose going up and down the plant, it can go in different places. Phloem cells are alive, so in comparison to xylem cells being dead, these are alive, and they have these cells next to them. In the diagram, it's these uh, green parts that are called companion cells. The companion cells are there to provide energy, and that energy is required because that sugar is going up and down the plant. The xylem doesn't need it because it's just capillary reaction just going up through the xylem. So that's the first thing you need to compare. Also, you'll notice that the structure is a little bit different, so we're just zooming in here a little bit. Main bit for you to know are these companion cells. So these little uh, green cells here that are added on, you can see the little nucleus on them. They are the companion cells. So if you think of the cells having a companion, having a friend right next to them, they provide energy for the plant vessels. The tube itself on the phloem is called a sieve tube. And these little uh, plate-like objects, I suppose, that look like sieves that are found in phloem are called sieve plates. So you may be asked to label these, so it's quite good for you just to know these. You've got the sieve plates that separate parts of the sieve tube, and you have your companion cells that give phloem uh, the energy to move sugar up and down. The next part we're going to look at is leaf structure. So this diagram here, I'm going to give you a diagram at the end as well, are all the different parts of the leaf that you'll need to look at. 
So first bit I want to point out on this diagram here is on the sort of bottom right hand corner, I suppose there's a yellow and purple uh, tube that's going through the, the going through the leaf. Now that is called a vein. So think of veins like we have in the human body that we're going to look at later on. Veins in leaves, so the veins that you can see on them, they are the xylem flow themselves uh, arranged together. So you can actually clearly see them. So if you get asked what is in the vein or what is the structure, it's a vein, it's xylem flow themselves put together. Now we're going to look at the rest of the leaf in a minute. So first of all, on the very top of a leaf, you have this waxy protective layer and it's called a cuticle. And what that does is it cuts down water loss and it just pr protects the cell. Uh, so that sort of waxy sheen that you see on the top there is a cuticle. Now I've got two different parts here that in the diagram are the kind of uh, browny green layers as well. And they are both called the epidermis. Now epidermis is just a term for a skin. So if you just try and think of it as a skin, the one on top is the upper epidermis and the one on the bottom is surprisingly the lower epidermis. So upper epidermis and lower epidermis is a skin. Uh, it's also quite protective but it's a place where we find different structures called stomata and guard cells. And they're going to be really important in a minute, but we're going to come back to them. To look at the rest of the leaf though, if you think of working your way down the leaf, there are these uh, sort of oval but arranged in a fence-like structure cells. These are called palisade cells. And this is where most photosynthesis takes place within a leaf. Now they're called a palisade because you may have came across something like a, a palisade wall where basically it's a, a fence made up of trees all, or cut down trees all stacked together. That's the name of the shape. So if you think about palisade being a sort of fence, these plant cells in the leaf that look like a fence are the palisade layer, the palisade mesophyll. The next bit is when you look down the way, there are other cells that are kind of clustered together, but not very neatly. There's lots of gaps between them. And these are really spongy. So these are called spongy mesophyll. And these are irregularly shaped cells and they don't fit together. The reason they don't fit together is because you can see the gaps between them. They have gaps for a gas to move around. So the oxygen and carbon dioxide that's going on in photosynthesis moves around through these air gaps. And we're going to look at that in a little bit as well. So again, remember the vein is made up of the bundles of xylem and phloem. And what I'm going to show you here is a kind of diagram that I give out in class, so it might be a bit easier for you to look at. It's missing the vein though. So you have your waxy cuticle on top, an epidermis, uh, upper epidermis there. Then you've got your palisade layer, if you're palisade mesophyll. You've got your spongy mesophyll, and you've got those air spaces, those gaps all between them where the gas is going to move about. You have your lower epidermis, and what we're going to really concentrate on is on the bottom, we have that little gap between the cells that you can see that is called the stomata. And on each side, of, each side of the stomata, there are things called guard cells. So let's take a closer look at those. So stomata, and you can see a microscope picture on the right here, are small pores that you mainly find on the underside of the leaf. And what these do is these let water vapor and gases in and out of the leaf. That's the entrance to the leaf. Now, each stomata or one stoma is surrounded by two guard cells. So you can see these kind of like two C-shaped bits on the side here. And guard cells, if you think they guard the cell, they control the opening and closing of the stomata. So this is what's quite important here. When a plant has a high level of water, we're going back to this term turgid. These guard cells are turgid. They are full of fluid. Uh, they have swollen up. They are turgid and it means that the guard cells curve out. That curving out creates an opening in the stoma or the stomata and that allows carbon dioxide into the leaf and it allows that oxygen that's being produced and as a byproduct of photosynthesis out of the leaf, which is important for us. The other thing that evaporates out through this open stoma is water. Okay, so if you have a high level of water, it doesn't matter that water is moving out. Okay, you can lose that, that's totally fine. However, when a plant has a low level of water, these guard cells lose water. So they are no longer turgid. And when they don't have that turgid C shape, they then close. Once they have closed, it means that the stomata are closed. There is no gap anymore. And gas exchange and water exchange cannot take place anymore. So this is especially important if, if your plant has a low level of water, the last thing it wants to do is let more water out through the stomata. You don't want that water evaporating off. So you close the stomata, you close the cell, uh, the guard cells to make sure nothing is lost. The last bit we're going to look at in terms of plant transport 
is related to this movement of water because the movement of water vapour out of the stomata is a process called transpiration. And transpiration comes up quite a lot and you need to know the processes of it, which is fairly straightforward. So first of all, if you imagine, this is almost a roundup of everything we've talked about in this lesson, where water is taken into the root hairs from the soil via osmosis. That's the first stage in transpiration, this journey of water. So the water goes into the root hairs from the soil, the water then goes up through the plant through the xylem tubes, and then finally water is lost to the atmosphere by evaporation through an open stomata. Okay, so just three simple stages, in through the root hairs, up through the xylem, and out through the stomata. Transpiration, just that journey of water throughout a leaf. The other thing I'm going to have a look at though, is what can affect the rate of transpiration, because transpiration can be uh, sped up and it could be slowed down based on different environmental conditions. So if you can have a think of any, that'd be great, but we're going to move on to the next part and just look at some things that can speed up or slow down transpiration. So to start off with, at high light intensity, if you think there's a large amount of light going on, then it increases the rate of transpiration because the stomata are open all the time. So high light intensity increases the rate of transpiration. Similarly, warm temperatures. If the temperature is warm, uh, water evaporates faster, so transpiration rate increases as well. And if we look at the opposite of these, if there is low light intensity, in the dark, for example, stomata close, they want to reduce that water loss, that decreases the rate of transpiration. And in comparison to warm temperatures, cool temperatures or colder temperatures, decreased transpiration rate, because water evaporates slower as well. So you think about two main ones here, light intensity, if it's high, then transpiration increases. If it's low, transpiration decreases. In terms of temperature, if temperature is high, transpiration increases. If the temperature is low, transpiration decreases. Okay, they're your kind of standard ones there. There are a couple more though. Uh, one of the things, moving air, which you could also refer to as wind, increases the rate of transpiration because if you imagine that that outside air is constantly being replaced by dry air due to moving air, um, then more water vapour is able to be accepted from the environment, from the plant. So wind or an increase in moving air increases transpiration. There are two more that decrease transpiration. One is humidity. So it's almost the, diff the opposite of wind, I suppose, where the more humid uh, the outdoor environment is, then that decreases transpiration rate as water cannot evaporate from the stomata. And last one is pollution. So one of the things we are finding just now is pollution decreases transpiration rate because these particles from pollution block up the stomata. If the stomata are blocked, then transpiration rate has to decrease because water cannot get out, which is obviously very bad for the plant. So that is transport systems in plants. It's mostly to do with water, um, but you really need to know that leaf diagram. Just make sure you know where you're upper epidermis, lower epidermis, spongy mesophyll, palisade, cuticle is. Then have a look at your xylem and phloem, know the differences between them. If you know the rate of transpiration, so very simply just the water moves into the root, moves up through the xylem and out through the stomata, and go into a bit more detail about that. And also as long as you then know some examples of what can increase and decrease the rate of transpiration, then you will be fine. So thanks so much for listening to this, folks. I'm going to uh, get the transport systems in animals uploaded so you can compare these, and then we're almost done with this part of the course. Okay, thanks so much for listening.